Hello, everyone. I am Professor Geek. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another book study. We have our uh, stream beginning here and we are this is the third, third stream, I think, third study in the Darth Bane trilogy. So going through Path of Destruction in particular here and do see, uh, see some. Oops, took the wrong thing. <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> Gonna uh, wait until the Wi-Fi clears up a little bit there for the camera, but uh, do want to welcome my co-host for the stream, as usual, Mr. Al Baca. Welcome, Al Baca. Hello, sir. How are you doing? I'm good. We're going to see how this this uh, this study goes tonight because I am. Oh, I just had a day. Uh, it's one of those days where I had so much to do, but like I, I was, I had to do a little bit of driving, and then I realized that I'd forgotten something, so I had to turn around and double back and go all the way back, and then it just like it feels like I spent most of the day on the road and not much at all actually doing the stuff that I needed to get done. So, got back and I was just like, ah, screw it. I'm just gonna take a quick nap, power nap before the stream, and and here I am, and I'm just like, oh, all right, let's do this, whatever. <laughs> so. We will uh, hopefully I will I will be coherent tonight and say something of value to people interested in the book. Oh, I'm kind of I'm kind of wondering what you forgot, but that's something else. I guess the key the key to storage. I was going to my storage unit, oh, yeah, which yeah. Is, is like forty minutes yeah. away because of where I worked, and uh, and I got halfway there and forgot the key, so I had to turn around and go back, and then turn around and go all the way back. And like, oh, it's a pain in the butt. Anyway, nothing nothing sexy, nothing nothing super secret or anything. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> thought, thought, thought you might be see, seeing a pizza behind Simon Graver's back. Uh, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I am uh, so so behind myself here that I uh, didn't even welcome the chat. So welcome to the chat. I uh, do see here um, Mag Magnino Alex 2 as the first up. Welcome. Good to see you there. Uh, Nathaniel Zalosball. Chatting uh, with people in the, the pre pre stream there, so great to see you, Melissa Harrison Sons, Horizon Talker, Samuel Proctor, Wolf 10 Media, Matthew Flynn, Zetopia, Chris P. Lots of folks in the house tonight, so that's great to see. And uh, yeah, hopefully, everybody's read along or at least caught up on the last stream. So, once we talk about it, but th this uh, is uh, you're really enjoying the book, you keep telling me how, like, wow, you're really enjoying the reading and stuff, right. I am. It's just uh, I just I find I I find Bane's journey very interesting. I know he's evil and all, but uh, like I said, when you have everyone else around him that's that much worse, it it you can't help but kind of root for him a little bit. Mm -hmm. I uh I, I wanted to give sound engraver my dear sound engraver her special greeting because as I saw her in the chat, she wrote. Dropping MOTU truth on Twitter, and she is my oh man, it's great. She keeps sending me screenshots of uh tweets. She's fighting the good fight over there in, in the slush pit that is Twitter, and everybody's like, you know, because Kevin Smith, he's he's a spin machine. Boy, he's acting like it's gonna be amazing. Everybody loves it. Yeah, right, right, Kevin. And uh, but you know, three or four people who, who follow him and, and want to shout down any criticisms are are screaming about it too. So she's just, uh, she, she's very, she's not trolling anybody really, but she's just sort of asking questions and like, cause everybody wants to pretend, you know, <laughs> that these images didn't come out or blah, 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 or whatever. And she just kind of just, you know, oh, what about this? What about that? What about this? You know? Know. See, they, they open their, they open their mouths and tried to get ahead of the social BS. And now it's biting them in the behind. Yep. 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 That's that's a whole other stream to talk about that because, uh, but luckily we don't have to deal with any of that here tonight. Talking about the glorious Star Wars EU, which they will never ever take away from us ever, even though they started to stop it and never never make any more of it because they're idiots. They uh, we still have the wonderful universe that was. Mm -hmm. So, following along in Bane's journey with these next five chapters, we're through sixteen or eleven through fifteen tonight, rather. So third third installment of our of our study here. We we followed him along an interesting journey. We we met him first on the uh, Apatros, planet of Apatros, mining the Coruscant there. Did I say that right? Coruscant. Uh, I forget. Anyway, probably not. anyway, but mining this this impenetrable, heavy, uh, 
hard material that's used on spaceships. Cortosis. Cortosis. I knew that wasn't quite right. Coruscite, cortosis. Okay. Um, and we talked about how that's a theme that we're going to see through the greater trilogy is that impenetrability, that, that hard veneer. And we see it in the cortosis at first. Obviously, we see it in Bane himself, you know, having that impenetrable veneer. He, we, we did see him flee the planet of Apatros to go join the Sith army, you know, because he, he was going to be sent to prison camp or prison, prison uh, planet for, for the murder of a Republic soldier. So he had to get out of there. And he thrived pretty well, actually, in the, in mm -hmm. the Sith army as a soldier. He was finding his place there. But because it's the Sith army, you know, he, he, uh, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't, couldn't escape the nonsense Sith, everybody out for themselves politics. And that was the last thing that this is kind of what he's been trained anyway, everybody out for themselves as a, on a mining planet. And that was what his, uh, his road his a uh, Nemoidian friend told him anyway, that mm -hmm. you, you know, the, the only people who survive in the world are those who looked out for themselves, you know? And, and it is interesting that he, his life was changed in the moment when he was actually thinking about others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. His, his, uh, his fellow soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. Because you think of it, we didn't really go into this, but you're right. He was the Sergeant. If he had gone ahead and let the Lieutenant <clears throat> um, play out the orders that were from on high as a Sergeant, as a commanding more of a, you know, a higher ranking, he probably could have laid back, probably could have somehow survived a little bit. I don't know, maybe, uh, but he was doing it for his soldiers, for his unit, you know, as the right thing to do. He was part mm -hmm. of a, a cog and a part of a bigger machine that he was, you know, believing in, and uh, or at least the system anyway. And that's what bit him in the butt. Now, it didn't, you know, he, he wasn't court-martialed or anything. The, the Sith recognized the power within him and took him to Korriban to train him to be a Sith master, a, a dark lord. As the, you know, we have the Brotherhood of Darkness at this point. They're not calling themselves Darth. There's no emperor. In theory, there's just sort of a, democratic brotherhood of Sith, you know, which sounds silly yeah. when you say it. I, I have a question now. I, I know that there are th the, th the three that are the primary. They're like the, the, the head ones. Do we ever find how many Sith Lords there are at this point? Not that I know of, but I really wasn't looking for the answer to that question in my yeah. reading of it. Um, we, we do get all the well, Sith Lords joining in a, in a place at one point so all of them do congregate in one place we'll, we'll yeah, watch for it at the end not like it, well see i wouldn't i wouldn't think of like actual number but is it like like once you've quote unquote graduated are you if you are a quote unquote sith lord and you take your place out in the world or universe or whatever i'm just wondering exactly to what extent because we know we eventually will get the rule of two well, we do know already with our reading tonight, remember, that Lord Khan is the the kind of the default leader, not right. technically, but everybody, you know, and he's the one leading the ar army against the Republic or the Army of Light, as the Jedi have, have bound together to call themselves. They, and uh, Lord Khan has put out the call already for every single Dark Lord and many of the students at academies even to come mm -hmm. join them on that planet that they're fighting over. So, so all the Dark Lords are at play. Right, and I was just just curious as to like, you know, how many are dark lords versus how many just your generic Sith troopers, you know, Sith yeah. troops, <clears throat> and uh, like I said, I mean, it, it it's going to be a bloodbath if they only get down to two. You, you will, you will, you will see. <laughs> I'm <friend>. sure, and <laughs> I'm just thinking ahead. You know, yeah, like saying, yeah. something bad's going to happen because well that. That's the tension hanging in the air, right? Because if you, if you know, for most Star Wars readers who come across these books, they know that this is how the rule of two comes about. You know, these books are the one are going to say it because we know through the the original trilogy and we know through um, the prequels and whatnot that the rule of two is a thing. And if you've been reading the Old Republic or, or have been released reading as it was released, then you know rule of two certainly wasn't the way it always was. So yeah, that's the tension hanging in the air mm -hmm. as you read these through. <clears throat> Uh, Matthew Flynn for five pounds said, I was going to say you forgot to mention Sound Engraver, but you did anyway, so I'll give you money anyway. Well, thank you. I really much, very much appreciate that, and I will never, ever forget my dear Sound Engraver. I wanted to give her her own special mentions. I didn't just want to throw her in with the uh, with the usual welcomes. She, she's, she's too good for that. Right? She's my 
She's my sounding, my, my Goldberry, if you were watching the uh, Tolkien book study Tuesday night. Here's where Al throws up. <laughs> Soundberry. <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. You're not going to be able to make that click. <laughs> Soundberry. <laughs> it's a stupid title. It's a stupid word. After this, I told him, he said that. This is Al. This is classic Al. When he likes something, or if he doesn't like something, he will fight you tooth and nail. Um, he said he said Soundberry on the stream, and I was like, "Nah, that didn't really work." So we talked oh, about something else. But after the graver. stream, yeah, Golden Grave or something. Where after the stream, he's like, "You know what? I kind of liked Soundberry. I kind of liked it." I'm like, "Yeah, it doesn't work." Like he's gonna it. keep gonna keep bringing it up. Kind I remember. Uh, I remember it was kind of funny when we were thinking about a podcast network. You remember that? And Fan Man was oh, like, "Oh yes." Fan Man was like, well, I, "I like kind of a iconic comic cast," and and Al just viscerally, "No, no, sounds too much like comic cast. Sounds too much like Comcast. I, all I hear is Comcast." And uh, Al was so like so on on point with making sure he shot that down every time it was mentioned that I would just start to bring it up randomly just to mm -hmm. trigger Al, and it would it would work. He'd say, "All I hear is Comcast. All I hear is Comcast." <laughs> like, easy boy, it's okay. I was very particular about, well, you know, that's his thing. It's his thing is being doing the slogans, doing the alliteration. Yeah, that's his, that's his, that's his gift. So don't you do it wrong around him. I know what I like and I know what I don't like. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Santa Gris, I don't think Professor Geek mentioned the cursed pizza I was jealous of on the Professor Geek stream. So she, meaning that I have to tell the story here now. <laughs> All right, well, we'll do this. We'll do this. Because, <clears throat> yeah, Al brought it up, and people aren't going to know what he's talking about. Okay. Then we'll get to Darth Bane. I did make Sound Engraver jealous. And the kind of the cat's out of the bag with the story now. I can't really do it as a punchline because people know, you know, from Al, what Al said originally. It's the pizza she was jealous of. There was this amazing, amazing stuffed crust pizza. Not stuffed crust, but, uh, well, they call it a stuffed pizza, just to differentiate it from what people usually mean around here when they say deep dish. But real deep dish like real chicago style deep dish not just a big fat crust and a little bit of sauce on top but like really like pizza soup that kind of thing and it was at this place that we usually get a pizza from whenever i'm visiting uh the sound engraver and so so we decided you know they i saw that they had it and i was like oh let's get that and, and sound engraver was all for it and i was so excited we went to pick it up and i just the smell of it is oh it's so great and i, I peeked at it and i'm like oh this is so great and and she was laughing at me because i was just so giddy because we picked it up and we were taking it back to her place and I set it on her stove and I opened up the top and I looked at it and just the, the, the smell hit me. It just looked so perfect. The, the heat, the steam. And I looked at it and it's like, wow, 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 wow. And immediately I hear behind me go, Hey, 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 that's reserved for me <laughs> because that, that is the phrase. That's something that I would say when, you know, she just naturally walks around the corner into her room because she takes my breath away. And I just go, wow, 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 wow. But apparently I said that about a pizza as well. So. So I was I was duly chastised for it, and uh, and here we are. There's the pizza story for the second time in one week. The wow wow is hers and hers alone. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> so now everybody's in the know, <clears throat> and there you have it. So let, let the pizza jokes commence. <clears throat> we'll also talk about how she ate all my food, but you know we'll talk about that another time. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> um. All right, so we left off at the end of chapter 10. Remember, Bane had called out a student for a competition and actually killed him. It was uh, Fogar, Foarg, the McCurth. I'm always saying his name wrong. I always, I always kind of want to say Foghat every time I see that. Foghat. Foharg, I think, is his name, the McCurth. Anyway, uh, he's supposed to yield at, this, at a point when you finally beaten them, but Bane didn't. Bane just let the rage flow through him let the force power continue to kill him. And in the, uh, <laughs> I'm seeing sound here. Like, That's not true. <laughs> in the, uh, in the morning though, you know, he broke a rule. So in the morning, he's summoned to the, the Lord of the uh, Lord Cordis, who is the dark Lord. Who's in charge of the, of the Academy there on Corban. And they have this really interesting conversation. <clears throat> now, Bane is thinking through some things on his way to Lord Cordis, it says, Fohard's death would have repercussions. Combat was supposed to test the apprentices, hard hardened their metal. 
those uh, through struggle and pain. It wasn't meant to kill. Each and every disciple at the academy, from Sirach down to the least and lowest of the students, had the ability to become a master. Each possessed an extremely rare gift in the dark side, a gift that was meant to be used against the Jedi, not against one another. In killing Fohard, Bane had thinned the ranks of potential Sith masters. He had dealt a serious blow to the war effort. Each apprentice at the academy was valued more highly than an entire division of Sith troopers. He had destroyed an invaluable tool for that Bane suspected he would be punished severely. <clears throat> now, this is this this would make sense of any any army out there, this kind of thought, except for the Sith and everything we know about the Sith. And this hasn't been the, the, the traditional way of the Sith. This is this way of the Sith that they're trying to and uh you know introduce now. And it sounds ridiculous. I mean, just reading that Sith, Sith are oh, that way we care about each other, guys. You know, join the brotherhood. <laughs> you know, it's just a silly word, right? Um <clears throat> so he thinks uh, he was already putting together his arguments. And these are his arguments, which sound more like Sith. Fohard had been weak. Bane hadn't just killed him, he'd exposed him. Cordis and the other masters encouraged rivalry and dissension among their charges. They understood the value of challenge and competition. Those who showed promise, the individuals who elevated themselves above the others, were rewarded. They received one-on-one -on -one instruction with the masters to reach their full potential. Those who could not keep up were left behind. That was the way of the dark side. Fohard's death was no more than a natural extension of the dark side philosophy. His death was the ultimate failure, his own failure. Why should Bane be blamed for another's weakness? Mm -hmm. Now that sounds more like the Sith we all know, <clears throat> right? Mm -hmm. So, I, go ahead. And I, I like how he's, as he's going to this meeting with Cordis, how it's just how he, how the author writes Bane's thought process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's like, I know I'm going to be blamed. I've got to come up with an idea. I was mm -hmm. like, you know, but it's not my fault. He was, you know, it's it's just it was a great, great way of. Uh, projecting his thoughts yeah yeah and it's interesting <clears throat> lord cordis isn't there to to um really reprimand him so much but he goes through and talks he says first of all uh lord kasim told me what happened and bane answers i'm not responsible for his death he was angry but he wasn't stupid uh he chose his next words very carefully he wanted to convince lord cordis not to not enrage him he says fohard was one who let his guard down he let himself vulnerable in the ring. It would have shown weakness not to take advantage of it. But then Lord Cordis comes back and saying, uh, no, Kasim said he did not lower his guard. Because when you go into a battle as a, as a Sith Lord or Jedi or whatever, you're supposed to immediately put up sort of a force shield, you know, around you. Uh, that, that, you know, against other force energies being hurled at you or whatever. Uh, he says, Kasim says Fohard did not lower his guard. Which tells us how powerful Bane is, too, just to be able to rip right through it, you know, when he was, uh, when he felt the force there in that moment. <clears throat> and uh, then, but look in the Bane's arguments, Master. Are you saying I should hold back if my opponent is weak? It was a loaded question, of course. One Cordis didn't even bother to answer. Uh, but eventually, uh, Bane says, um, Kasim knew what was happening. He saw, he could see I was what was I what I was doing. Why didn't he stop me? Why not? Indeed, Cordis replied smoothly. Lord Kasim wanted to see what would happen. He wanted to see how you would act in that situation. He wanted to see if you'd be merciful or if you would be strong. So again, right there, Cordis mm -hmm. even is, is, you know, the good thing is to be strong, which in that case was to go ahead and uh, break the rules, <clears throat> you know, kill the student there. So you can see that the the whole structure, the, the philosophy that the Brotherhood of Darkness has here isn't even holding up under its own scrutiny, under its own rules and, and, and uh, operation procedures there. Uh, but Bane does start to get... Uh, <clears throat> special treatment, special that the masters want to want one on one training with him. But here we have that night in his room. This is important. He, t he, he goes to sleep that night. He's struggling to make sense of what had happened. He said passion fueled the dark side. Bane had felt that, that enough times to know it was true, but he couldn't shake the feeling that there was uh, more to it than that. He didn't consider himself a cruel person. He didn't believe he was ruthless or sadistic. Yet how else to explain what he had done to the helpless McCurth? It had, it had been murder or execution, and Bane was having trouble accepting it. So now you have, <clears throat> this is another real threshold for Bane personally. Bane is always, and still to this moment, <clears throat> is uh, everyone for himself. I'm not out to help you. I'm out to succeed myself, every person for themselves, period. And that is the dark side way. That's, that's you know, it's a natural fit. 
and Bane's starting to ask himself now, but what he did to McCurth killing him was that is that okay? Is that should should he be okay with that too? And he has this really interesting dream in which he dreams about the last night before his father died, when his father gave him another brutal beating when he was just a teenager, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 17, 18, something like that. And uh, his father breaks his ribs, breaks his nose. I mean, just really gives him a brutal beating. And uh, overnight, Bane hears his father doing this drunken snore and Bane's staring at him too much in pain to go to sleep. And he's dreaming about this memory. And he just looks at his father thinking, die, die, die. I wish you would die. I wish you would die. I wish you would die. And sure enough, his father has a heart attack by the morning. So Bane in this uh, nightmare has this revelation that he actually killed his father too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, we don't know this revelation through the next chapter here weakens Bane in the force. He loses his ability. He says, um, was this Fohark wasn't the first person he had murdered with the force. He probably wouldn't be the last. Bane was smart enough to understand that. But the realization did nothing to quell the uneasy feeling in his stomach. And when he closed his eyes, he could still see his father's face. <clears throat> Throughout chapter 12, we find Bane falling behind in his studies, in his ability to use the force. The uh, Lord Kasim, the blade master, realizes it, tells him that, don't even come back unless you're ready to actually open yourself to the dark side. Something in Bane is lost at this moment. He's lost touch with the dark side. <clears throat> and we don't know why. Now, you can speculate as a reader, okay, well, does he feel bad? Did he kill his father? Or or what's, you know, because we, wanting a, a protagonist we can kind of root for, are wanting to see something like that in him. And I like the way Carpishan lets us have that possibility for a little bit, you know, <laughs> just yeah. to show you. Just because, a little bit. <laughs> just a little. Because like I said, Bane's not the character that you root for in this story. Now, you have to root for him in certain situations because he makes the people around them so despicable. And we'll see him do that even uh, more so in, in a, some cool ways here in a moment. But we have this mystery, you know, why is this Why is this happening? So Bane falling, um, you know, falling behind in everything, uh, basically. And you stop me if I'm skipping over something that you want to mention now. Okay. But uh, let's see. Okay, so eventually they're doing another gathering there, another moment where the, they can call each other out to, uh, to to a competition. And remember at the end of Bane's duel with Farg, he had been called out by the Zabrak, Sirak. Sirak's the top student at the academy. Nobody disputes that. And Sirak basically told him, look, until this moment, you were beneath my notice. You were beneath my notice. But now, now I'm watching you. And, and Sirak said, I don't call people out. I don't need to. I'm too great for that. But you'll want to call me out at one point. So it was, Bane has reached the point where not only the, the teachers there have, have noticed that he's fallen behind, but the other students have noticed too. And he said, it's only a matter of time before one of them calls him out in a competition. Mm -hmm. And if he lost, loses to one of the weaker students, then he's he might as well just hang it up and leave, you know, at that point, because all prestige is lost. Everything's lost. So he has this moment of... Uh, yeah, because he because <laughs> it, I mean, it says at the end, like, soon a challenger would step forward in the dueling ring, eager to take him down, and there yeah. was nothing he could do to stop it stop that moment from coming. Yeah, yeah. He He's lost his edge. Something happened to him. Yeah, and he doesn't know. He it's like, I know I'm good. I've been good before, but like it, it's like a switch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's what, lost that touch. Off. Yeah, yeah, he lost touch of the dark side somehow. And um, so his <laughs> he got, he comes up with this plan, which at first you're thinking, what in the world are you thinking? But then they give you his thoughts afterwards. But as they're all gathered uh, there to, what's up? Are you going to skip over the Lord Khan part with them losing Rasan? Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Where is that, Cassine? Where is that? It's it's in the middle of the chapter, like right <clears> after <throat> actually what I had just said. In the middle of chapter thirteen or twelve? The one we're. On oh yeah, right twelve, now. twelve. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I was looking for that to make sure I didn't. Yeah, so we do get our first. Um, well, not our first. Another uh, little breakaway from um from Bane's story. Now, while we're talking to the last time we we broke away to see Lord Khan's army. And how Lord Khan was using the battle meditation to fight against the Jedi. Well, now we break away again, and we see uh, the Twi'lek that eventually brought that originally brought Bane there. Lord, um, what's his name now? Uh, Kopesh. Kopesh, yeah, Lord Kopesh, <clears throat> talking to uh, to Lord Khan, and they're talking about 
what's going on with the war because the war is still underway between the Brotherhood of Darkness and the Republic. And the Brotherhood of Darkness has been winning. The Republic realizes this because the force is no match against soldiers. And the Brotherhood of Darkness has such a, a uh, concentrated force of, 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 jet, or of dark, dark, dark lords, you know. And uh, we find out that the Jedi have gathered together all of the Jedi so that their army is now called the Army of Light. They're not really using soldiers anymore except for in a support capacity. They're actually using uh, Padawans and Jedi, and they're all this big army of Jedi, and, and they're, they're start suddenly starting to wipe the floor a little bit with the Sith. Khan realizes this. Now they're over... Yeah. What's that planet you mentioned, Al? Um, Rusan. Rusan. Yeah, they're over the planet Rusan. And that's kind of where the uh, where the battles are, are being concentrated. So you got the Army of Light versus the Brotherhood of Darkness. You know, some poetic. Yeah, because he said because says Hoth, Hoth knows the Jedi aren't capable of defeating the vast defeating our vast armies. Khan explained, "Not anymore. The Republic is doomed. So now he concentrate exclusively on us, the leaders of those armies. Cut off the head, and the body will die." Yeah. So it's and, a, uh, a and much Hoth, needed change of strategy. Yeah. And Hoth is the leader of the Army of Light. Right. Yeah, I'll just say Hoth is the, the Jedi general responding here. So they, they look at the, the planet there and they see what's happening is the native population of Rusan, the Sith, don't care about them. You know, they're just fighting the war wherever they can for whatever reason. But the Jedi are actually trying to keep the fighting to unpopulated areas, are trying to center it around ways in which they can actually protect the population of Rusan or the, or the, uh, the fields of Rusan. So there's a little bit of predictability, predictability to their, their, uh, movements and whatnot on the planet. And they need though, they need a, a, uh, they need a way to find out exactly where the weakest point is, where they'll be moving from time to time. And they have that, they have that by a young Jedi who's decided to defect to the, uh, to the dark side here. <clears throat> and, um, of course we do. One of the Jedi will give it to us, Khan says. The flaps covering the entrance of the long tent serving as the Sith War room parted as if on cue, and a young woman, a young human woman clad in the robes of the Jedi Order stepped through. She was of average height, but that was the only thing about her that could ever be called average. She had thick raven hair that tumbled down past her shoulders. Her face and figure were perfect examples of the human female form. Her tricopper hued her tricopper-hued skin was set off by green eyes, smoldering with a heat that was both warning and an invitation. She moved with the lithe grace of a Twilic dancer as she walked the length of the assembled Dark Lords, a coy smile on her lips as she pretended not to hear their whispers of surprise. Kopej had seen many striking females in his time. Several of the female Dark Lords gathered in the tent were gorgeous, renowned as much of their incredible beauty as their devastating power. But this young as this young is this young Jedi drew closer, he found he was unable to take his eyes off her. There was something magnetic about her, something that transcended mere physical attractiveness. She carried her head high, her proud features issuing an unspoken challenge as she approached. And Kopej saw something else, naked ambition, raw and hungry. At his side, side Khan whispered, remarkable, isn't she? She reached the front of the tent and dipped smoothly to one knee, bowing her head ever so slightly to defer in deference to Lord Khan. Welcome, Githany, he said, monitoring, motioning for her to rise. We've been waiting for you. So this is their, their new Sith, uh, Sith, uh, what's the word, proselyte or, or uh, convert, rather, who is uh, who's going to tell them the movements that she heard. And she was basically seducing this. Uh, head of the intelligence or whatever, this head of this this uh, unit or whatever, to find out where they're going to be weakest and whatnot. So she's giving that information to them. So that is uh, that's what's going on on the battlefront, and that's how we meet the character of Githany. And then she'll enter our into our academy here in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> now back to chapter thirteen, the confrontation, yeah. and. And one hella butt whooping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, yeah. So I think I, I, I kind of uh, we had two two uh, jumps to Lord Khan and the army, and I kind of smushed them together there. But that's okay because we'll just keep moving through the Bane se session. Yeah, I was, I was wondering, I was like, 
Wait a minute. She comes in later, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Told you I'm a little flustered today, but we're getting the whole story. And, and you just it's, wanted to get to Giffany. I well, know. it's it's I cool know. what Carpishan is doing because Carpishan at first is saying, um, maybe there's hope for Bane. Maybe there's hope mm -hmm. for Bane. And then we get this moment here in which he's going to call out Sirach, the Zabrak. The Zabrak, who is the top of the academy. And you're thinking, what are you doing, dude? What are you doing? If if any, if you're scared of some of the lower students being able to mop the floor with you, why would you step out and call out the top student ever there? And then it says he's hoping that the fear, right. the visceral fear that of no, knowing what, what a whooping guy he's got coming his way will snap him out of it and help him break through and touch the dark side again because the dark side is emotion, passion, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. Oh, it does not work in a magnificently <laughs> painful way. And uh, I, I won't read the whole battle or anything, but it is, uh, oh man, it is, he he beats down, he doesn't kill Bane, but he beats him down to just, just nothing. Cracks all of his ribs, crushes his nose, uh, another snap as he crushed to the ground, his body passed into a state of shock. I mean, bones, jagged uh, bits of tooth shooting out of his mouth, bolts of pain shooting through his broken jaw. Slumped forward, barely conscious, as Sirak stepped back and lowered his saber, reaching out with a free hand to grab Bane around the throat with a crushing grip of the force. He raised his arm, lifting the muscular Bane as if he were a child, then hurled him across the ring. A uh, coughing fit racked his body. He heard, he heard rather than felt the grinding of his broken ribs. Mm. Everything began to dim. He caught a glimpse of a pair of blood-flecked boots striding toward him, and then Bane surrendered himself to the merciful darkness. Yeah, was, I mean, I mean it just some of the language the author used. I mean, Bane's skull exploded. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> as as Sirik's forehead slammed into his face. And remember, this is, a, a, if I'm correct, Zabrak is a Darth Maul. Yeah, so he's yeah. got those little pointy things on his head. Yeah, but he so headbutts him with the flat yeah. part of his forehead so he doesn't stab him. But yeah. Well, well Otherwise, I'm sure, kill some, I'm sure something might have gotten in there. It depends on how long it was. Maybe you hit him with a little one, but uh, <laughs> they have to have a hard head to support. Yeah, that kind of a structure. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. I would not want to get head butted by a brat. <laughs> now, it's an interesting, it's an interesting experience as a reader because you don't. Bane isn't somebody. You know, he's not going to turn into the hero you want him to be. You know, mm -hmm. he's not. But he's the only character you've been given as a main character to follow. You do find out what's going on with the war, and you're starting to kind of hope, you know, the Jedi can do this or that. As you know, they ultimately will, right? I mean, we know that the, the, the Sith don't rule the, uh, the Republic. We know that the Sith Empire is a thing of the past by the time we get to the prequels and whatnot. So we know ultimately who wins. So it's never a question of, oh, you know, maybe I should root for these guys to win. No. But we know we can't really pull for Bane because he's he's not. But there, he's Carpishan's teasing you with it. You know, maybe mm -hmm. maybe he's got a little bit of redeemability there or something. Um, and then he gets just brutally wounded, and it's it's painful to read. But you're not really pain. It's not like watching a good guy that you really dearly love go through it. But still, it's painful to read. So then Bane is like, "What else is there for him?" He he does wake in a in a uh, back to tank, so he's not killed. They're letting him uh, rejuvenate and whatnot. And then we hear about Githany. Githany coming over to, to the Sith side on the front, which brings us to chapter 14, in which Githany enters the academy. So she's she's uh, converted there on the field, but she was just a Padawan of the Jedi. So, of course, she can't just convert to the front lines of the Sith. They're going to send her back to the academy to learn all the ways and thoroughly be ingrained in the dark side. Mm -hmm. But uh, Bane wakes in the in the, uh, the back of the tank. He... Um, there's an exultant mood at the Academy because of this great victory that Githany's intel has helped them achieve, helped the Sith army achieve. And all this rumors is going around, but they just really feel like, you know, score one for us. You know, we've really beaten down the Republic and whatnot. <clears throat> Githany's pretty popular because she herself is, is, uh, has been a part of this. And she comes back into interest, enters into the Academy with a certain amount of prestige already. I mean, because not only, I mean, she, not only does she have her predilection for the dark side, but she's had training in the light side. Mm -hmm. So she can kind of bring the jet, the Jedi mindset more, uh, to, 
to the uh, the Brotherhood of Darkness. Yeah, give them a little bit of more insight into yeah. the, the Jedi the Jedi way. And we'll hear about specifics of that insight in a second. Yeah. So they we have this interesting scene, which I think is kind of telling of where his character's at in this moment, and we're kind of bringing Githany into his world, and we're going to see how he how he responds to her because he would mm -hmm. seem like it would seem like he's prime pickings for her, right? She's yeah. she's an evil of the dark side, not from rage and violence, but through lust and seduction. You know, who's going to have her way with you? And you would think that maybe you know at the at the bottom of the barrel that he is, he'd be susceptible to this. You start to suspect this anyway. So yeah, Bane right. is walking. Go ahead. I mean, at this point of the story, he's a broke. He's bro he's broken. Yeah, yeah. Physically, mentally, every in every which way a man can be broken. That's what Bane's <laughs> doing right now. <laughs> it's very true. It is very true. Yeah. Um. So he's walking down the hall at one point. Just he's still kind of healing up a little bit, and he hears some other students kind of whispering and and um contempt contemptibly whispering about him. He says Bane didn't react. He was dealing with the emotional pain in the only way he knew how, the same way he dealt with it as a child. He withdrew into himself, tried to make himself invisible to avoid the scorn and derision of others. His defeat, so public and so complete, had destroyed his already suspect reputation with both students and the masters. Even before the duel, had, uh, had sensed, many had sensed that his power had left him. Now their suspicions had been confirmed. Bane had become an outcast at the academy shunned by the other students and disregarded by the masters. Even Sirak ignored him. He had beaten his rival into submission. Bane was no longer worthy of his notice. The Zabrak's attention, like the attention of nearly all the apprentices, had turned to the young human female who had come to join them shortly after the Battle of Rusan. Her name was Githany. You know, so we, we meet her <clears throat> again. Bane had heard she had once been a Jedi Padawan, but had rejected the light in favor of the dark. A common enough story at the Academy. Uh, Bane's not. Bane doesn't seek her out. Bane is uh is off doing his own thing, trying to be invisible. Now Bane finds um uh, finds solace back in the ancient text. Remember we talked before about how, just like in the beginning, he was forced to use the older mining equipment, which he knew thoroughly well. And then when he's a soldier, he prefers to use the older rifle that was first given him that he knows in and out, and he's a complete expert with. And here at the academy, even before his defeat. He was always making sure he spent time studying the scrolls, the ancient knowledge that a lot mm -hmm. of the other acolytes didn't bother with. They were just wanting to, to study at the master's feet, you know, not worry about the ancient wisdom and the scrolls. Well, he returns to these scrolls. Um, he drudged on through the halls, head down, making his way to the library located in the depths of the academy. Studying the archives had seemed the best way to supplement the teachings of the masters in the early stages of his development. Now the cold, quiet room far beneath the temple's main floors offered him his only place of refuge. Not surprisingly, the massive room was empty, save for the rows of shelves stacked with manuscripts, haphazardly arranged and then forgotten. Few students bothered to come here. Why waste time contemplating the wisdom of the ancients when you could study at the feet of the actual Dark Lord? Even Bane came here only as a last resort. The masters wouldn't waste their time on him anymore. But as he perused the ancient texts, a part of him he thought dead began to reawaken. The inner fire, the burning rage that had always been his secret reserve was gone. Still, even if only faintly, the dark side called to him, and Bane realized that he wasn't ready to give up on himself, and so he gave himself up to studying. It wasn't permissible for students to remove records from the archives, so Bane did all of his reading here. Yesterday, he had finally completed a rather long and detailed treatise by an ancient Sith Lord named Naga Sadao, who, of course, is the, <clears throat> the first you know ancient Sith Lord we read about in the Old Republic comics. We entered his tomb in the Knights of the Old Republic game. Even in that, he had uh, found small kernels of deeper wisdom, of Sith alchemy. He had claimed of his own. Bit by bit of his knowledge was growing. He walked slowly up and down the rules, uh, glancing at titles and authors, hoping to find something useful. He was so intent on his search that he failed to notice the dark hooded figure that entered the archives and stood silently in the doorway watching him. And of course, after the break, we realized this is Githany. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So here we go. Githany is is seeking out Bane. Now she's seeking out Bane because he was the the last one defeated by Sirak. She's entered into the academy. Sirak's a top student. Of course, she wants to find the way that she can eventually become the top student there. That means defeating Sirak, the top student. And what can she learn from Bane, who he'd so thoroughly conquered and who had had a, quite a reputation before then? She knows she's heard the stories, so she's going to see what she can learn from him. 
it's interesting. She goes up to him and she's she's very much in seduction mode. And and you're thinking, you know, how is he going to react to this? He's not just uh, he's not wagging his tongue after her. He's not, you know, just anything you say, yes, yes, yes. But he's not cold and, and unresponsive to her charms either. But it's really interesting because, you know, just as Bane said, he didn't think of himself as cruel or ruthless. He's just out for himself and he's cold and calculating. And he's balancing that cold calculation for his own best good with his inner rage and inner passions and everything like that that he can't quite get in touch with anymore. Hmm. And she's pretty straightforward about why she's talking to him. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, she almost, but there's a little bit of a lie there. Well, a little uh, bit. But I so, mean, but she, straight up, she she's like she placed a hand on his forearm. I I need you. I need mm -hmm. your help against Sirach. Yeah. Well, we get here first. Bane carefully opened the pages of the ancient volume he had taken down from the archive shelves. It was titled "The Ricotta and the Unknown World," and mm -hmm. according to the date, was nearly three thousand standard years old. But it wasn't the title or subject matter that had grabbed him. It was the author, Darth Revan. Revan's story was well known to the Sith and Jedi alike. What intrigued Bane was the use of the Darth title. None of the modern Sith used the Darth name, preferring the designation Dark Lord. Bane had always found this puzzling, but he had never asked the Masters about it. Perhaps in this volume, by one of the last great Sith to use the designation, he could find out why the tradition had fallen into disuse. He had, now, he, we, we already, he was reading by Darth Revan a little bit before, too, and he, and he knows that Revan did end up converting back to the, uh, to the light. So, But at, when he was Darth Lord, when he was Darth Revan, apparently he wrote these these scrolls, and we know that in the game, right? Because he was writing and, and leaving records behind that he really later rediscovered himself when he uh, had, had converted back to the light. So Giffen, he strides up to him, says, "I've been looking for you. I need your help against Sirak," she says, as as Al says. But uh, he says, "I can't help you with Sirak. You know, he, he kicked my butt. What can I do?" <laughs> she says, "Just listen to what I have to say. Say I know what happened to you in the dueling ring." I know everyone believes Sirak destroyed you and somehow the defeat robbed you of your power. I can see you believe it too. Her face had taken on an expression of sorrow, not pity, thankfully. Bane didn't want that from anyone, especially not her. Obviously, it's a beautiful woman that he's, he's taken with. But he showed genuine regret as she spoke. She showed genuine regret as she spoke. When he didn't reply, she took a deep breath and continued. They're wrong, Bane. You can't just lose your ability to command the Force. None of us can. The Force is part of us. It's part of our being. I uh, heard accounts of how you, what you did to the McCurth. You know, she heard about that fight. She says, I know better. I can sense the power inside of you. I can still feel it. And Bane is honest. He says, the power may be there, but my ability to control it is gone. I'm not what I used to be. And she said, that's not possible. So she does this thing. She tells him to close her eyes. She has her hand on his, and she she tells him to, to focus. She's drawing, uh, drawing him, uh, exposing the weakness of something only a fool or idiot would risk here at the Academy. Yet the hard truth was that Bane had nothing to lose. So he tells her, all my life I've been driven by my anger, he, he explained. He spoke slowly, staring down at the surface of the table, unable to look her in the eyes. My anger made me strong. It was my connection to the Force and the dark side. When Fohar died, when I killed him, I realized I was responsible for my father's death. I killed him through the power of the dark side. And Githany asked, so, so you felt guilty? No, maybe, I don't know. Her hand was warm, he could feel the heat. So he, we get we find out a little bit more of what's going on, why he lost this connection. It's not because, oh, no, I realize I'm a murderer now. And that's never what I meant out to set out to be because he doesn't care about other people. He cares about himself. Now, he's not out to sadistically harm other people. He's just out for himself. And he will harm you if you get in the way of his own self-good. I'm trying to make that distinction. That's still an evil, right? It's still selfishness. Mm -hmm. It's still from the same from the same side of the dark side there. But there's a difference. He doesn't find pleasure in the pain of others. He will use the pain of others, though, and, and do anything he needs to you if it means achieving his good. So it's an important distinction to make. He's not somebody who's going to go torture you for the fun of it or just because, you know, he's, he's going right. to you just stay out of his way. And if you're in his way or if you have something he wants or if your death or pain in any way will benefit him, he will he will pursue it upon you. You know, it, so it's. It's like the old, it's like the Dungeons and Dragons thing. It's a lawful evil. He has yeah. a code. He has, yeah. a, he, he has a method. It's, mm -hmm. it's still just evil, not, but yeah, he's evil. There's a method but to it. A but, he's just, but he's just not uncontrolled. He has, a, yeah. he has a control and he has a, and he has a, a like I said, a code yeah. that he yeah. follows. So when she takes his hand and she tells him to, uh, to, to, to come with her, you know, close her out, close his eyes. 
She says, the dark side is emotion, Bane. Her words came to him from a long way off, faint but unmistakable. Anger, hate, love, lust. These are what make us strong. Peace is a lie. There is only passion. Her words were louder now, loud enough to drown out the drumming of his heart. Your passion is still there, Bane. Seek it out. Reclaim it. And then as if in response to her words, his emotions began to well up inside of him. He felt anger, fury, pure pulsing hatred, hatred of the other students for ostracizing him, hatred of the masters for abandoning him. Most of all, he hated Sirak. And with the hate came the hunger for revenge. Then he felt something else, a, spir a spark, a flicker of light and heat in the cold darkness. His mind lunged out and grasped the flame. And for one brief instant, he felt the glorious power of the force burning through him once more. When Githany let go of his hand and it was gone, snuffed out as if he had merely imagined it. But he hadn't. It was real. He'd actually felt it. So what's really interesting here is that he is he needed a feminine side of the dark side to rebirth that dark side within him, rebirth his connection. He needed a little bit of, I don't even want to say the word motherly, but the dark side version of the motherly, right? He needed that feminine care to come the warmth of her hand. We get the descriptions. She's talking about emotions rather than rage. Rage is an emotion, but she backs it up to, you know, love, lust, you know, uh, rage, any of that. That's what kind of re-enters it. And you think, what is the one thing he's never had is a mother. He, his mother died in childbirth, which is why his father hated him. There was no mother figure on uh, Patros. The, the Nemoidian was maybe the closest, but he, it was a, 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 a man, sort of an uncle-ish type mentor or whatever. So he's never had that. Uh, now he suddenly gets a little bit of that in Githany, but he knows not to trust her. He does know not to trust her. After they have this, um, so they agree. Okay, well, and she's, she's honest to a point. He says, I know that you're not just here to, to help me. She says, no, I need, I'll need allies. Sirach, if I want to defeat Sirach, he's got his Zabrak following him. I'll need allies too. And I know that you're strong in the force. I'll need you with me. What he, uh, what, and they decide that she's going to train him. The masters won't train him anymore. So they're going to meet there at nights and she's going to teach him everything she's learned from the masters that day. Now, later on, we find out she's not actually planning on teaching him everything. She wants to keep him one step beneath her so that she mm -hmm. can, he can be of use to her and, and never be a threat and so forth. But that's the deal. Uh, he knows this, you know, on one level, because then he says, well, it's interesting. First, before I get to that, um, as they're parting there, her reasons made sense, but there was still something bothering him. Lord Cordus and the other masters wouldn't approve of this, he warned her. You're taking an awful risk. Risks are the only way to claim the reward, she replied. Besides, I don't care what the masters think. In the end, those who survive are the ones who look after themselves. It took Bane a second to realize why her words sounded so familiar. Then he remembered the last thing Groshik, that Nemoidian friend, mm -hmm. had said to him before he left the Patros. In the end, each of us is alone. The survivors are those who know how to look out for themselves. So, again, the, the, the motherly figure, dark motherly figure or whatever, uh, echoes the only sort of mothering you know, pr presence he had, which was Groshik, which wasn't really mm -hmm. feminine. Now he's getting that in the feminine. That's helping him kind of rebirth that to the, uh, to the dark side. This, his 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 connection to the feminine throughout his journey is interesting, and we'll see that as we go along. Mm. Um, but he knows, or so he knows too, that she's going to keep him underneath her, so he can't just have all of his eggs in the basket of her training. So it's an interesting scene that we get next when he goes at night to Lord Kasim, the the Blade Master's. Uh, room I, and oh, begs him to continue training him begs him to meet in secret please continue training me and it's interesting Kasim says why would i do that why should i do that and he's got an interesting argument for him he says you know my potential bane press cordis has cast me aside if i succeed now he cannot take the credit if i become an expert warrior for the brotherhood lord khan will know that you were the one who trained me and if i fail no one will ever suspect your part in this you have nothing to lose Pretty solid argument. Pretty solid argument, you know. And Kasim agrees. So what were you gonna say, y'all? Uh, just a uh, thing about about Githany when, because uh, Bane asked her, it's like, why did she leave the Jedi? And she's like, I'm not ready to share that yet. And he understood yeah. that he wasn't quite there with her yet. Mm -hmm. and it's like there was he he had to earn 
uh, her her trust in this situation. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, but also there was the the thing about when he was feeling that fire again, it was through her touch. Mm -hmm. There was like it's like she was feeding him that fire. Yeah. And I did, and I was just you know we didn't really touch on well, it much, but she, I did well, want no, to bring it up. It's not her feeding it to him; it's her leading him to it. It's that mother yeah, figure, like well, I was saying. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I said. But it, it's like, but without the like that physical touch, it, like the the for like the force between them, the shared whatever it is, it's kind of kind of helped reignite it. Yeah, that's the motherly because, energy. Yeah, and like I said, when she brought took her hand away, it, it disappeared. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. old yeah. It's her motherly presence that's going to help him back into this. Right. Um, she doesn't bring him all the way there just right like that, and then he has no need of her. She's going to stop yeah. and, you know, but, yeah. But, yeah, but I just think it's interesting that it, that it was the physical, that it mm -hmm. was the touch aspect as opposed to just talking about it or anything like that. It was due to the physical touch. Because that's a feminine thing, right? That compassion right. of touch. Not a, that's, a, that's a compassionate thing that you'd see from a feminine energy that you don't see from any of the lords there, the masters right. there. Right. Um, I just want to catch a super chat before I get it and forget about it. Uh, Matthew Flynn says, are the old Lego Star Wars games EU canon? Uh, not that I know of. No, that those are just kind of fun little Lego games. That, you know, that's There's no real way to... They tell the stories of the old movies anyway. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't really have anything specific. I want to talk about the generally things what happen in, in chapter 13, or 15 rather. But uh, there are no real specifics. So it's interesting. He starts to excel. He excels in his training with Kasim. The, the blade master to the point where, and he does learn Kasim has a double bladed uh, saber training saber. Cause he uses mm -hmm. a double bladed saber period. And Sirak master uh, or Sirak has a um, double bladed training saber. That's what he kicked his butt with. So Bane asked questions about it. You know, what are the differences and, and what are the, the strengths of it and everything. And uh, Sirak has some interesting things to tell him about a double bladed saber that you actually, it's not as versatile as, as a, as a single blade. It can cause more damage, but it's not as precise. The big thing is it sets your opponent off guard because it's unusual. They're not mm -hmm. used to fighting against double bladed, uh, you know, sabers or, or, or training sabers or whatever. So we get an interesting kind of back and forth about that. It's the unknown. And we'll see that come back into play a little bit later. But uh, he starts to, he starts to, to um, reclaim his ability at the dark side so that he's a great blade master, but he's also, surpassing githany in their nightly training she won't admit this to him she's a little concerned about this but when when she uh is trained on how to use force lightning and she trains him that night he's bringing down just these torrents of lightning and everything mm -hmm. like that and it, and it says in, in her in memory not even sirak could manage more of a than a little spark like none of the students could do that that day but he's here just pulling it all down so he's he's reignited that uh that dark side with, within him, and it's not all a focused on the rage of his father. So the question here is, what was it? What was it that, that broke him, uh, his connection to the dark side? I would argue that he was solely dependent on his connection to the dark side through his rage. Once he realized that he had actually killed his father, well, they're kind of, he realized that sort of a revenge had already taken place at that point. Like, how mad can you be at the per I mean, you can still be angry at what his father did to him, but he he exacted the ultimate revenge. He murdered his father. So he kind of lost connect. He was solely dependent on the rage. And it's not until Githany comes and tells him in that kind of feminine dark side part where she says the dark side is emotion, not just rage, emotion, rage, love, lust, revenge, all of that. That's the dark side. And that opens himself up to the broader passion, uh, emotion. And that's where he's tapping back into the dark side, even more so than he had previously, because he's not just dependent on the rage and the anger. Right. Because it was the rage at his father that was the fuel. And when he realized that he was the one who had killed his father, because before his there was all this, you know, unresolved issue. But when he realized he actually did resolve that issue, then the rage, it, it was like he had completed Mm -hmm. it. so there was no more fuel left yeah yeah now there is an interesting little moment at the end of the chapter when Githany's is training him with a i do want to say just you know when when he was talking to kopish just, just, 
just how weird is it that uh, Gethany uses a whip? Yeah, yeah. So Gethany uses a lightsaber whip. The crystals yeah. are bent, and it's 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 like a whip. It's 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 a weird thing. Yeah, you can't imagine how much and, good it would actually do in a saber battle. But and it, you know. and he mentioned that that it's not a powerful weapon, but like the double bladed, bladed lightsaber, it's different. Yeah. So you're not used to it, and mm -hmm. you know if you're not used to something, it, it will it'll throw you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And um. Which is kind of a picture of Githany herself. He's not used to her, so but mm -hmm. he's learning from Kasim to expect the unexpected. And that's what I love about this little back and forth they have here at the end of chapter 15. So this is when she's training him in the in the library down there at nighttime or their secret time when they meet. And uh Bane has proven that he's just he's calling up torrents of force lightning. You know, he's kind of scaring her a little bit because she wasn't able to do that. So they finish up for the night. She puts her hand on his shoulder, so we should we should finish, you know, we should uh, wrap up for the night. <clears throat> He comes over and he starts to massage her shoulders, which she lets him, you know, so we get this, you know, little connection there. But she starts to open up a little bit and tell him about why she left the Jedi a bit. And she talks about this uh, Keel Charney, the, the guy that she'd seduced in order to give to, to find out the intel that the Jedi needed. Uh, were you really attracted to him or just the idea of disobeying your master? Bane asked. She thought about it for a long moment. A bit of both, perhaps, she said finally. He was handsome enough, strong in the force. There was an undeniable attraction. Bane only grunted in response. His hands had stopped massaging and were now resting on her neck. <laughs> so a little bit of, but, so you kind of think, oh, is he just going to be sort of a patsy for her? But uh, they keep talking and he's asking her more questions. So what, what happened? And he said, um, eventually he says, the tension in Bane's hands had ceased ever so slightly. Is he dead? She laughed. Did I kill him? Do you mean? No, he was still alive. At last I heard. He may have died battling the Sith on Rusan since then, but I didn't feel the urge to kill him myself. Then I guess your feelings for him weren't as strong as you thought. I like this. Githany stiffened. It might have been a joke, but she knew there was truth in Bane's words. Kiel had been convenient. Though there was this physical attraction, he had not become he had become more than a friend, mostly because of her situation, studying day and night with him under Master Honda. The pressure of living up to the unrealistic ideals of the Jedi, the stress of being trapped in a seemingly endless war on Rusan. Bane wringed her neck with his hands, his touch firm but not tight. He leaned down and whispered in her ear, causing her to shiver at the warmth and closeness of his breath. When you finally betray me, I hope you care enough to try to kill me yourself. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, talk about it just cutting to the quick, like, you know, seeing behind all of her machinations. I remember when I when I got to that line, I'm like, oh, he's not stupid after all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. And I like the way Carpishan does this because he's an omniscient narrator. He'll get into the head of Githany or the head of Bane, never more than once per scene, you know, or jumping from different ones per scene. But even though we, we are in Bane's head sometimes, we're never knowing the extent of what's going on. He just kind of shows us that. So when he had that conversation mm -hmm. with Lord Kasim, talking about the, the different saber training, we see now that he's applied that of expecting the unknown to his dealings with Githany in general, the unknown of her feminine energy coming in there. Uh, of course, she's not having, she's going to do the, the usual thing. Like she, you know, she jumped from her chair, slapping his hands away and spinning to face him. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. And, you know, he does the little, Oh, I'm sorry, Githany. It was just a joke. I didn't mean to upset you. Like suddenly <laughs> you're playing the little boyfriend or something, you know, <laughs> which, you know, is not there. He's, you know, he, what he's doing. Oh, yeah, he's not stupid. Uh-uh, uh-uh. <laughs> no. He oh. knows little Miss Giffany has her own agenda. <laughs> I like that she stopped. Hey, he has his. <laughs> so she's like, I opened up a painful part of my past. She, she does that, that, you know, oh, how dare you? You've hurt me. You should be bad for yourself or whatever. You're right, he said. I I'll go. She studied him as he turned away and made his way out of the archives. He seemed genuinely sorry for what he had said, as if regretting hurting her. The perfect situation to give her the emotional leverage as she'd been looking for. If only she hadn't seen that flicker of something else. Once he was gone, she shook her head, trying to make sense of the situation. Bane looked like a great hulking brute of a man, but there was wisdom and cunning beneath his heavy brow and bald skull. She thought back on the last 20 minutes, trying to determine when she had lost control of the situation. <laughs> <laughs> this is just awesome writing. <laughs> there had been sparks between them, just as she had intended. Bane had done nothing to hide his desire for her. She'd sensed the heat as he creased her neck. Still, something had gone wrong with her carefully planned seduction. Was it possible she actually felt something for him? 
Githany unconsciously bit her lower lip. Bane was powerful, intelligent, and bold. She needed him if she was going to eliminate Sirak, but he had a knack for surprising her. He kept challenging and defying her expectations. She had to admit she found him intriguing in spite of this, or perhaps because of it. Bane was everything Kiel had not had, hadn't been, ambitious, impulsive, unpredictable. Despite her best intentions, some small part of her was drawn to him, and that was more than anything else made, uh, made him danger, a dangerous ally. What I love about this little piece of writing here is that this could come from a romance novel. Mm -hmm. This this little bit right here could easily, you know, the 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 woman out to just make her on her own and and use the men as resources around her suddenly meets her match and oh is she daring to fall for him? But you know the book isn't going to go quite like that. It's kind of like uh, Joe Jackson. Was it Joe Jackson who did the Kenobi? Um, Joe John or Jackson Miller? I forget his name. Anyway, um, how he was using the the genre of a western and even sort of that romance style western. Mm -hmm leaning on that for certain tropes but you know it wasn't going to work out just like that either because it's a star wars novel and you knew kenobi wasn't going to end up with her you know and stuff like that but here we have uh Carpishan doing the same thing with this sort of uh possible sith love story kind of thing going on is it's knowing what we know about bane it's, it's all the more interesting because you know he's not going to end up in a romance with her or something you know and that's the end they live happily ever after you know that's not going to happen Tonight so on it's Hallmark a, Channel. Yeah. <laughs> Destruction. Darth Bane and Dark Lord Githany. <laughs> the Bane of our love. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but it's interesting. I just find it as a writer myself and as a student of writing, just the, the, the use of other little genre tropes in there. Mm -hmm. So uh, we end chapter 15, pushing us into an interesting cliffhanger here. Not cliffhanger, but uh, tension before a storm. So what's going to happen? They do talk about... Um, make sure this was in there and I didn't I'm not remembering that this was ahead. Yeah. They do talk about how she was wanting to go ahead and she wanted to go ahead and uh, challenge Sirach the next morning. Now he says, I know what you want. You want me. This wasn't the story, right? Al? This was in our reading, right? They talk about challenging yeah. Sirach. Uh... I'm blanking like if I if this was later and I'm just kind of pushing it back. I, I don't think there was any talk about actually doing it. Okay, well, well, we'll, we'll wait on that then. But they are at the point we know that at some point it's coming. Bane has is, is been training. Bane is, is becoming more and more powerful. So at some point here, the the, the confrontation with Sirach again is going to have to happen because that's what they're training for, you know. So we're, we're, uh, we're ramping up to that moment, getting it. It's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, Samuel Proctor talking about he's watching Revenge of the Sith right now. Sidious is telling Anakin about Darth Plagueis, the last few Sith descendants of Bane. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is where it all comes from, from, from Sidious's talk with Anakin in, in uh, episode three. So what's the reading for next time? We're just going to keep doing five chapters, I think. Let, let, me, let me double check and make sure those five chapters aren't crazy short or something. But um, no, If anything, they're kind of a little bit on the long side. It goes up to part three, the end of chapter 20. You'll be okay. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm just saying. It's 191. It's not that bad. 252. That's not bad at all. It's a short one. It just seems thick. Mm. <laughs> I was said. always trying to get out of more reading. That's what she said. This uh, is not Fan Man's channel. No one's going to laugh at you. Uh, <laughs> 30. Yeah, there's 31 chapters, but I think that that extra let's see. Yeah, I still think that's good for next time up through chapter 20. Uh, the the last two two d d split ups, we'll have to throw in an extra chapter in there somewhere because there's 30 or half or something. I don't know because half uh, uh, there's th 31 chapters in the book total. It's not it doesn't end on a uh, um, divisible of five, but. Uh, but yeah, I think this is good. Plus, you got off easy with a, with not as many chapters for uh, Lord of the Rings next week. That's true. Well, that's true. No, I'm not worried about the amount of it. I just, you know. <laughs> um, I just start a little earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Samuel Proctor said, that makes me think if Bane's dark side powers diminished after he realized he exacted revenge... To his father, then Palpatine was at his weakest right after he killed all the Jedi. Yeah, well, they, if if that was like a, a general thing to happen, then yeah. But but no, that, that was just sort of something specific to Bane because of his own uh, his own 
things he was going through there. And Palpatine was farther along and Mm -hmm. more emotion floating around. There's, there was more in that than just wanting revenge against the Jedi. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I do see this. My dear sound engraver went ahead and told the story of uh, her eating all my food to uh, everybody. Uh, What was that? Because I didn't see it. (laughs) So we went to, to Arby's for one of the meals when I was there and we both got wraps. I got the, the, turkey bacon ranch wrap with no onions. Always make sure I specify that. And she got the Mediterranean wrap. And we were both starving, too. We Because we, we, she was playing violin at a special church that morning, so we didn't really have much breakfast. And it, we were actually there for two different services for her to play the violin and special music, and it was really wonderful. She performed beautifully. It was really great. But uh, we were both starving, and we make it back to this Arby's, and I'm, I'm, I got some fries, because I was like, I need to eat something now. So I start noshing on the fries, and uh, she had said, no, she's not going to eat her wrap until she gets there. But she, now she's thinking, maybe I'll eat a couple bites. So she, she opens up her wrap. And her couple bites end up being basically at least three quarters of the whole thing. Because we're both just so starving. And then at some point, I forgot what makes her think of it and reach down. She's like, wait a minute. This is your wrap. Oh, you realized that after eating three-fourths of it, did you? <laughs> that She felt horrible. And she was saying, uh, we, you can have mine. But the Mediterranean has Onions. onions. So that's that because wasn't it's gonna a, work. That's because it's good. <laughs> now, the way you say med, what's what's in the Mediterranean? Is that is that like the gyro? The the gyro? I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. The year, the Our man, she, she, she says no. That's not true. It was half of a half. I, was it? I don't know. Oh, that's right. Yeah. No, it was most of a half. It was most of a half. So I still had half of it. Anyway, the point is, I told her, I was like, I so don't care. That is no big now. But come on, guys. I want points for this because you guys know that's one thing. That's like a guy code. Like woman does not eat your food. Like you don't go have these and orders at the restaurants. You order some fries. The worst thing a woman can do is reach across the table and just have some of yours. That's just like a no, no at all. But it didn't even remotely bother me because it was sound engraver. She can have all of my food. I don't care. She's just, she's, she's my, she's my goldberry. She can have it all. <laughs> Didn't bother me a bit. She felt really bad though. I said, no, 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 it's fine. It's all good. I will happily starve if I can gaze upon your beauty as I do it. You know, you say that, but in your voice, there's still a little tweak of the dark side that she ate half of your food. Nah, you're trying, you're trying to get me in trouble, but it's not going to work. Cause I was so noble in that moment. I'm not and- trying to get you in trouble. <laughs> Would I do that? No. I, I did tell her, I did tell her I keep bringing it up though. Cause it's funny. No, I, I, I admit I've done a similar thing. I, I had a, I had a, an ex-girlfriend, um, hand me a, uh, uh it was a Easter coconut chocolate nest thing uh, and she's like oh here and she meant me to take a bite well I ate the whole thing I thought she was giving me this whole thing she, she, I, I never did hear the end of it <laughs> it's like that episode of uh, my name is Earl when he's in Mexico trying to hunt down his brother and he doesn't speak a lick of Spanish and this kid holds up a churro and says something in Spanish so he reaches over and takes a bite out of it. he's like Oh, not bad. Looks like a hot dog. Tastes like a donut. And then the child says something else and it shows the subtitles. It's like, I wasn't (laughs) offering it to you. I was showing it to you. I only get one a year. (laughs) 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 Oh, but that's, that's the thing. She said, no, it was an accident. It was, it was not even remotely. I am sure it was an accident. She, she was, she was perfectly, perfectly vindicated. She can well, have the whole thing if she wants. She, you know, she'll just have to buy you the next pizza. Well, I think that night we had the pizza, so it was all good, if I'm remembering correctly. That was Sunday night, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so it, it worked itself <laughs> out perfectly. I have not had a good deep dish pizza since I one from Costco. It's good stuff, good oh, stuff. Oh, God, yeah. Now I want pizza. <laughs> well, we are at the end of our time tonight, folks. I've got uh, didn't get anything done today. I've got to go try and get some stuff done tonight. But uh, but we did have a good time going through this uh, this important portion of the book. Now, mm-hmm. next week's five chapters are really going to take us through, and we're going to finally get over to the Jedi side as well because we've been hearing about the war. We're concerned about what's going on, or we know ultimately what's going to happen. We just don't know how. 
because you know you don't no one comes to the darth vane trilogy not knowing anything about star wars right that just doesn't happen so mm -hmm. um so it's interesting people are speculating as to whether or not bane's going to have children they keep saying um you know and somebody said well sith probably don't have children no sith actually cloned themselves and become skywalkers you didn't realize that <sighs> that's what uh that's what happens now <laughs> Right. She wasn't a clone. Palpatine's daughter slash clonish. Well, yeah, whatever, but she stupid. wasn't a clone. Though. I don't think she was a clone. I think he was a clone. He was a clone of a clone of a clone at that point. Yeah. But anyway, that's that's the continuity that shan't be named around here. Anyway, I was just as yes, yeah, Alexander says burn. I was trying to burn the burn mm -hmm. the Disney trilogy. But uh, that's all for tonight. Five chapters again next week on Thursday. I'll be back tomorrow night at 10 p.m. for my live stream, in which I finally figured out the title for my live stream. It's going to be fun. I was going to say uh, it's going to be uh, idealization versus sexualization. And why? And there's one more versus in there, too. Um, what was the other one that I forgot? There's two things, two, two, something, the something versus something, and why ideologues can't tell the difference. There's a second part of it too, this uh, that it's blanking on right now in my mind, but that's about half of it anyway. So we're going to talk about both of those things. Uh, the other thing, which I can't remember, and then that thing, we're going to talk about how ideologues can't tell the difference because of the blinders of their ideology. Mm -hmm. And specifically, we're going to talk about the human stuff and uh, and some other properties too. So it's it's a good one. Uh, but there's something. What is the other the other verses? Um, and. Uh, I don't know. I'll try and think while Al tells you what's coming up on his channel. Uh, well, not on my channel, but I will be on with um, ne on Nair's network on Saturday night for the re a rewatch of the Steve Martin, Lily Tomlin film, All of Me. Oh, interesting. And um, a week after that, next Saturday, not this Saturday, but next Saturday, I will be having a rewatch July 3rd of the Bill Murray's first film, Meatballs. Mm -hmm. uh, a little, uh, going to have a little summer vacation month Yeah. Uh, uh, for uh, July. So yeah, July 3rd on my channel, 10 p.m. that Saturday is Meatballs. And there may be an announcement to come about a little extra thing, but I've got to hear about something first. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't remember what the second one is, but if you tune in later tonight, I'll set up the stream later, and, uh, and I'll remember what that other versus thing is, this distinction that ideologues can't make, but I just fried right now, my poor brain. So uh, that's all. That's what's coming up. I do have another video dropped by four tomorrow, too, so that'll be a, that'll be a good, interesting one. It should, should get some hits, so uh, more things to come. Check out Al this weekend, and uh, yeah, till next time, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the hero stories you love. <laughs>